Welcome in to the New Orleans Saints podcast, hosted by Aaron Summers and John DeShazer. You'll hear from players, coaches, broadcasters, and writers who cover the team on a daily basis. The New Orleans Saints podcast starts right now. Here's your hosts, Aaron Summers and John DeShazer. Welcome into the New Orleans Saints podcast. I'm Aaron Summers alongside John DeShazer. We are celebrating a big win over the Atlanta Falcons. Always good to get a win last game of the season against your rival and play the way that the Saints did. Big 48-17 victory. It was fun to watch. There was a lot of different players that got involved offensively, especially some of the younger guys that stepped up and made some big plays. So that was good. It just, it was a good feeling to end the season on. Yeah, well, I mean, in the end, it's bittersweet because, you know, the sweet is you win the game, you blow them out, mm-hmm. you know, you finally get what you want to get out of the offense. Score 48, which is a season high. I think they hadn't scored that many since like 2021 or 20 or something like that. I looked it up yesterday and I can't remember exactly, but it's been a long time since the Saints had scored mm-hmm. 48 points. And the bitter is obviously not making the playoffs. But yeah, you got a chance to see some of the young guys who you think will figure prominently in the future of the Saints, whether that's Chris Olave, who makes the great juggling touchdown catch, or Rashid Shahid, who makes the great contested touchdown catch. Or A.T. Perry, who makes the great contested touchdown catch. Or if it's um, Kendra Miller, who runs one in and and really showed a great nose for the goal line by extending the football, which, hey, young man, don't do don't make a habit out of that. Mm-hmm. But, you know, you just saw a lot of the young guys, especially on offense, who you feel like are going to be prominent in the future of this team. And obviously you see a game like that and you wonder what if, you know, if the Saints had been able to put it together in week eight offensively instead of week 13 or 14 or whatever it was. But, you know, it is what it is. I mean, I think I don't know who it was. I can't remember who he was yesterday who said it best, but he said, look, this is what we played ourselves into. And this is what we have to accept, basically. Um, you know, this is what we we earned for ourselves. And, you know, now you, you put it in somebody else's hands and this is what you get. But, you know, it, they really finish with a flourish. They win you know, four out of the last five. So that's something to build on for the offseason. Obviously, we don't know what the continuity is going to look like because the roster changes every year. Mm -hmm. But at least there's some momentum there that you can reflect on and say, you know what? A lot of the guys who did those good things should be back on the roster next year. Yeah, Coach Allen talked about that in the media on Monday afternoon that some of the players that made plays in this last game are who you're going to start building this younger core around. He loves the veterans that he has here, still feels like a lot of them can play, but definitely wants to start incorporating some more youth and talent on this squad. So there there are going to be changes, as you mentioned. There always are. But he does feel good about the the core that he has here. And quarterback Derek Carr, just he was a big part of why the Saints came on towards the end of the season. He ends Week 18 with the highest quarterback passer rating in the league. He's had 14 touchdowns, two interceptions since week 14. He's played really well and led this offense to a lot of success. He did exactly what he was brought in to do. and He did exactly what a quarterback needs to do. A uh, quarterback needs to be productive without turning the football over. And a lot of that came from the fact that the offensive line improved, obviously, uh, because it's a lot easier to throw the ball when you're upright instead of you running around for your life and you're on your back getting, you know, getting your shoulder knocked out of whack and, and, and getting a concussion and those kinds of things. So it helps that you're healthy. But I thought his decision making really, really skyrocketed toward the end. And really, you know, you saw the trust that he had with his receivers because he's throwing them, you know, back shoulder contested catches. And those were throws that he made kind of early in the season. He Mm -hmm. made a couple of them, but really got, I think, a little bit more efficient at him at the end. And especially with A.T. Perry. A.T. Perry, 6'5", as a receiver. He's got some size. So you can utilize that. And you see that big fella out there, and he's one-on-one. You just throw it out there and give him a chance. And A.T. Perry has shown down the stretch of this season, if you give him a chance, that's probably about an 85 90% chance he's going to come down with the ball. Or it won't be intercepted. So I, I really like that combination. So, But Derek Carr did exactly what you hoped he would do when you brought him in. You hoped he'd bring some efficiency to the, to the position. You hope he'd cut down the turnovers. You hope he'd br- be productive. And it took a while to kind of get there because, again, 
I thought the offensive line play was shaky in the beginning. Mm-hmm. I think everybody thought it was shaky in the beginning because it was shaky in the beginning. But once that settled and they kind of got their offensive line together and got that chemistry together, and then Derek Carr was able to get healed up completely because he deal, he dealt with the AC joint sprain. He dealt with a couple of concussions. He dealt with some fractured ribs. So once he was able to get healthy, I think you saw the offense ascend and you saw his production jump. Mm -hmm. Here's Coach Allen on Derek Carr. He said that he felt like Carr was playing some of the best football that he's played, not only this year towards the end of the season, but in his career. I think there was a number of factors. I think A A was health. Um, I think B, protection. I think C, guys around him played better. Um, And so I think that, you know, um, it's obviously the ultimate team game and it's never one, it's never one person or one thing. Uh, But I thought those were the factors that, that led to him playing. um, Look, certainly his best football for us, you know, over the last five or six weeks. Uh, But I think some of the better football that he's played. Talks a little bit about the offense, but defensively, you know, DA addressed this as well. He didn't feel like it was as dominant of a defense as we're used to here with the Saints. They definitely it showed. Wasn't. <laughs> it wasn't. I mean, they showed <laughs> more aggressiveness in, as far as takeaways and getting to the ball and everything like that. Until the, and really until three of the last four games, they found the run defense because when they were in that stretch where I think it was an eight game stretch where they gave up at least 108, 113 rushing yards, at least in every game. And a couple of those games, they gave up 200 yards. Mm -hmm. You can't win in the NFL giving up 200 rushing yards. You just can't. No team is built that way because when you're giving up that many rushing yards, the opposing offense has you on your heels all day. You're guessing and you can't stop anything if you can't stop the run effectively. So they kind of rediscovered that at the end of the season, but, there's no way run defense wise they're they're satisfied with what they saw now points allowed which is the most important statistic in football on defense they were pretty good they were top 10 mm-hmm. uh, they were good at that they were good at keeping teams out of the end zone they were good at keeping scores down but they've got to be better in the run defense area because again if you can't stop the run the other team can control the clock they keep your offense off the field so it doesn't matter how good your offense is playing they have limited chances, and then the desperation jumps because they feel like, okay, we're only going to have X amount of possessions in this game. We're going to have to score on every one of them. That's a lot of pressure on an offense, and a lot of that comes when you can't stop anything on defense. So they've got to be better in the run defense game next year. And they thought they had kind of found the formula to that with Colin Saunders and and with and – with Nathan Shepard. Nathan Shepard when they brought him mm-hmm. in at defensive tackle. But they didn't quite get that production out of him. And this team missed a ton of tackles this year. Yeah. And so that there are two things that have to be cleaned up. And you can't blame it all on Shepard and, and, and Colin. And that's not fair because they can do their jobs. And if the linebacker misses a tackle mm-hmm. or if the safety misses a tackle, then it looks bad for everybody. So it's not fair to just blame those two guys. The entire defense has to be in on the tackling. They have to be in on the run fits. They have to be in on their assignments. You got to trust the guy next to you that I'll do my assignment and he'll be where he's supposed to be. Because if he's not, the next two plays, you might get a guy out of position trying to do something that he shouldn't be doing, and all of a sudden your defense is compromised. they got to be a better run defense team. They have to. You love the points allowed, but they've got to be better run defense because, again, if a team's running the ball against you, they're possessing the ball, and your offense isn't on the field. And if your offense isn't on the field, obviously it can't score. Mm -hmm. Defensively, though, I think it – the fact that they were able to be so good against the pass, despite not having cornerback Marshawn Lattimore for the back end of the season, is a great thing to come away with here because you had a lot of different players that came in in the secondary due to some injuries, and they really did step up when they had their opportunities. They've got to love the way that Paulson Adebo responded this year, you know, probably his first full healthy year, kind of, mm-hmm. at cornerback and leads the team in interceptions with four. They've got to love the way Isaac Yadam responded off the bench when Marshawn Lattimore went down because Yadam, has pl- he played well for a vast majority of this season. I know he had more than 10 pass breakups, which is significant mm-hmm. because you knew teams were going after him. Got to pretty much be satisfied with the way Elante Taylor played. It, he was a little bit a little bit choppy at, 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 at the slot corner, 
he had to grow into the role because as we as we learned from him on the podcast, he was not fond of it. Right. He did not want to do it. And then he went in and he did it. And I think he's going to be better at it if he studies his craft, which we think he will, because, you know, last year he was kind of competing at cornerback and playing a little bit at slot. But they had Brad, Bradley Roby at the slot. And right. so he didn't necessarily get a lot of reps there until Roby was traded right at the end of well released right at the end of training camp. So he'll have an entire off season to kind of put in that work. When Yadam got that injured, slot position. <laughs> against the Falcons, he comes in. He's you know, two. after he'd been replaced at slot, he goes mm-hmm. in at the corner, and then he intercepts the pass to start start the second half to kind of jump start the team. So, you know, they've got some guys in the secondary that you know you add another piece or two, and I think they feel pretty good. You have to feel like Marshawn Lattimore if he's going to be back on this team, and I think he will if he's back and he's healthy then you've got a really good, solid rotation of cornerbacks that you can play. And I don't want to forget about Ugo Ugo Amadi Mm -hmm. because he played well in the slot also. And, you know, if you want to go even further in the secondary, the safeties, I thought, you know, played pretty good. Jonathan Jonathan Abrams came and gave him a little something off the the bench. After he'd been watching for a good majority of the season, Tyron Matthew was kind of Tyron Matthew. He gave you some honey badger moments, you know, during the season. So he played pretty well. But I thought I thought Jonathan Abrams was a nice little find toward the end of the season where he was able to come in and give you some contribution. Yeah. And then you have rookie Jordan Howden that he stepped in multiple times throughout this season. I think they feel very highly about what he's going to be able to do just based off of his rookie season. And he seemed like a confident guy when he stepped in. I I think a lot of the rookies did. We saw running back Kendra Miller have a really good game here to end things on. It's been a tough season for him, but you have to like the way he responded in this last game and put together one of the team's better rushing games. Yeah, he looked healthy, which is the key word with him because he's been dealing with that health thing Mm -hmm. since he was drafted all through off 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 season workouts, all through training camp, you get into the regular season, he plays a couple of games, he's injured again, he sits out seven straight games, he's able to get back for the season finale, and boom, you know, the brace is gone. He looks like the guy that they thought they were going to get when they drafted him. So he's a really big piece of the puzzle because you add him to the backfield, and if he's going to have that kind of showing mm-hmm. all the time, he's got to play. He's got to play somehow, somewhere. They got to figure out a way to work him into the rotation. You can't have a talent like that, you know, chasing down, uh, covering punts and covering kickoffs. He's got to play on offense. And I think he kind of opened some eyes to where, okay, this is exactly what a healthy Kendra Miller is and exactly what the Saints can use for that offense. Overall, the Saints having over 150 yards on the ground yesterday. Miller gets into the end zone. So it was good to see that. And then, You see Peyton Turner return to the field, another player that we were so excited about heading into this season who got injured in the first game against the Titans, gets an opportunity to come in here against the Falcons. He's a fumble recovery. Yeah. I mean, just good to – really, it was – he could have played and not had a stat, and I would have been happy for him. Because it was just good to see him back on the field. Uh, I don't think – Everybody has a a good idea of the severity of the turf toe he had, Mm -hmm. but it was major, major. And it puts him on injured reserve basically for 15 straight games. He can't play for 15 straight games before he comes back for for the Atlanta game yesterday. And just to see him suited up, you know, really had to be uplifting for his teammates because they know what the – nobody knows what these guys go through more than their teammates. They see him in rehab. They see him after surgery. Uh, they see him, you know, when he's trying to work out and get his get his you know win back and mm-hmm. trying to get his get his stamina back. They see all those things. They see the guy when he's on crutches or when he's on that little wheel, you know, that little <laughs> that little bicycle thing that little they're pushing around. Thing, yeah. yeah, I mean, <laughs> they see all those things, and all they can do is give him encouragement and hope that he can be back. So to get him back in uniform and then. He's got two uh, quarterback hits, and he's got the fumble recovery, which is significant. I mean, just to be where he's supposed to be, and the ball's loose, and he dives on it. He doesn't try to. He he said he thought about trying to scoop and score. I'm glad he didn't. I'm glad he just got on the ball and was done with it. But it was just good to see him in uniform at all. No, it's definitely good to see that because. You never want to see a player's career get derailed by injury like that. And I know he was really excited coming into this season on what he was going to be able to do. 
There was another player that dealt with some injuries to start his season. He was benched earlier this year, the offensive lineman and Trevor Penning that DA talked about today. Yeah. He had some poignant things to say as far as how they need to handle that situation. Well, he said, it, basically, he said it's a dual responsibility. It's the team responsibility and Penning's responsibility to develop him. Now, Penning's got a lot of work to do, a lot of work to do, because he's in a situation where he's a first-round pick. They started him some games. He wasn't reliable enough. Mm -hmm. They didn't even use him as the jumbo tight end, as the extra lineman at any point. So he's got a lot of work to do. And we don't necessarily know because DA didn't specify. He, um, They might be open to a position change. I'm not exactly sure where that change would be. Well, Andrews I mean, Pete stepped in and played very well left tackle. And I don't think you can move. If Andrews Pete's going to be here, I don't think you move him out of left tackle. I think he played well enough to have that position. But maybe Penning can play left guard because James Hurst has proven to be a guy who's a jack of all trades. And he'd be a great value as the sixth offensive lineman mm -hmm. because he can play every position on the offensive line. So if somebody has to go out, James Hurst can walk onto the field and play immediately. And I think that would be the greatest value because it looks like Trevor Penning is going to have to isolate on a position, learn that position, develop at that position, and get good enough to start because he's a first-round pick. He's going to have to play. Right. He's going to have to play. I mean, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. He's going to have to play. And I don't necessarily know if they're going to move him to defensive tackle, but he's going to have to play. He's got to get on the field, and he, it's going to be up to him to help develop himself. He's got to be a willing participant in this. And, the, and, and look, the coaching staff is going to have to have a vision for where he can play because the vision was at left tackle. Right. It looks like that vision might not work. So now they're going to have to be flexible enough to say, okay, if he can't play left tackle, can he play left guard? Can he play right tackle? Because we don't necessarily know what the situation is with Ryan Ramchek either. Mm -hmm. So can he, but he's going to have to play. There's too much value. There's too much invested in him to not give him another chance to be on the field. He's going to have to show he can't play anything before you can just dismiss him because you've got too much invested in him. So they're going to have to get, they got to give him another chance, but they got to figure out exactly where they feel good that he can play. And I'm not necessarily sure that it's that left tackle. So if he's got to go to another position, he's going to have to be open to it and willing to it. And I don't know why he wouldn't be because if I'm him, I just want to get on the field. Mm -hmm. I want to show that I can play. And so the team needs to get him on the field, and they got to figure out the best way to do that. Yeah, it's a good point about Ramchek. He's somebody that is anticipating the possibility of having surgery in the offseason, dealing with that knee injury pretty much throughout his whole career. It's kind of been something that's yeah. bothered him, and, and now he might actually have to have surgery to hopefully get it fixed. And, and when Ram misses games, he's hurt. Yeah. He is hurt. He's not injured. He's hurt. He's been a guy who's been able to play on that, that knee – for years now, and obviously it got to a point where he just couldn't go on it. And so there's going to have to be a decision made by him and the organization to kind of figure out what's the best path best path going forward because, you know, he gets that Wednesday rest day. Mm -hmm. You know, he gets, you know, Tuesday off, obviously. You know, he gets light days through the week, but he hadn't been able to manage it good enough to get through this season. And you, it doesn't matter how much you manage it through the week, you still got to play the game on Sunday. And the game is still grueling and people are still rolling up onto your legs mm -hmm. and, you know, cutting you and those kinds of things. So, you know, it's, it's, it's something that the – the organization and Ram have to figure out. So head coach Dennis Allen talked about, you know, the totality of the season and something he brought up was a cultural adjustment that he felt like needed to take place here. The Saints have always talked about the great culture that they have in the locker room, how it's a family, how everybody really cares about each other. You've covered this team for a long time. What have you seen that, that might be a little bit different over the course of this past season that they might need to pinpoint? I, I think, and, and I think the familial aspect is still there, but I, I think there might be a little bit more outspokenness. And, and I, don't, I don't know that that's a bad thing. Guys are t entitled to their opinions and those kind of things. But you don't always feel like all – the, the oars are rowing in the same direction. And I think that's what he's talking about, you know, in terms of a cultural change, trying to make sure that everybody's rowing in the same direction. Because there have been times where, you know, you hear, hear a comment here, you'll, you'll hear a comment there, and you'll be like, hmm, that seems a little bit too critique -y. 
There's some undertones there. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. And, and so, you know, I think he wants to make sure that he can get everybody rowing in the same direction. And so, obviously, he knows more about it than we do. Now, how do you get those guys, everybody, in the same direction? Because you're talking about you're talking about 53 guys on a roster, minimum. You ain't talking about practice squad. Mm -hmm. You ain't talking about injured reserve. So, really, you're talking probably about, you know, 80 guys around the locker room. That's a lot of personalities and a lot of alpha males and a lot of people who are strongly opinionated. And so how do you get everybody to humble himself and give to the team? And when things aren't going well, because over the course of an NFL season, there are some, there are some things that are bound to go wrong. Does everybody stay rowing in the same direction or does people have, you know, do people have little, you know, little snide things to say yeah. off to the side and those kinds of things. So those are the things that you're trying to eliminate. You can't totally eliminate them because people are, you know, football players are people and people are human and humans. We do, we say stuff that we shouldn't say. All of us say stuff that we shouldn't say, especially when stuff gets tough. That's why they say think before you speak. And yeah, uh, yeah, you yeah. just don't all the time. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it, but it's, them, you know, guys are emotional and guys think they know best. And so it's difficult for emotional guys to mm -hmm. hold on to their opinions all the time. And then we get mad with them when they won't talk. So, I mean, it's just tough to be, it's tough to be, I guess, I don't want to say political, but it's tough to say the right thing all the time. Mm -hmm. But he's got to make sure that he's got guys in that locker room who understand how to say the right thing all the time. You can't point fingers at teammates. You better point a finger at yourself and yourself only because that's what makes a good locker room accountability, you know, not, you know, Hey, you know, I, I know who did it and it wasn't me. No, I know who did it and it was me. And you know what? I got to be better. That's the best way to handle mm -hmm. everything in a tough situation, whether it was you or not. So he's probably got to get a little bit more of that in the locker room. And I, I think there were some noticeable times where they didn't necessarily have that in the locker room. I think it, I think there was more of that toward the stretch. And you could see it in the play, guys playing for each other. These guys have to play for each other every week because the NFL is hard. You can't go out there and win a game by yourself. It's mm -hmm. just, it's just, it, this ain't like the NBA where, you know, a guy might get 60. This isn't it. You know, the quarterback's got to have cohesion up front because those guys got to protect for him. And if they don't protect for him, the quarterback can't be pointing fingers at the offensive line because, you know what, there's going to be some times where you're going to throw a ball that's going to be a bad ball that's going to be intercepted, and they're not turning around pointing at you saying, hey, what's up? Mm -hmm. So you got everybody's got to take care of each other and everybody's got to have each other's backs. And I think there's got to be a little bit more of that next season. A lot of players in the locker room today talked about the chemistry that they started developing over the last month or so and how that really needs to continue over the off season. So the question is, how do you do that when everybody goes their different directions? You know, guard Cesar Ruiz said, it's just about staying in, in touch with people, making sure that if something does happen or something's changing, then we all know, and we're just checking in on each other. You know, maybe there are a couple of trips where you yeah. see somebody again, but making sure that you do continue that communication throughout the off season. So you're all on the same page when you get back here. Yeah. And it's a, it's a lot easier to do it between the quarterbacks and receivers because, you know, the receivers need to catch and the quarterbacks need to throw. So you can get those guys together and, you know, hey, everybody come and fly out to Vegas or wherever, and we're going to work out together. Sure. And it works that way. Now, with the offensive linemen, it's a little bit more difficult because sometimes you'll have those like offensive linemen camps and those kinds of things. And it's a little bit harder to keep those guys together. But once you get into the offseason and get guys because they played together and that and that helps a lot, because no matter what offensive line combination you bring back, those guys have played together. Even if it's Cam Irving at right tackle, he's played there. You know, if it's Max Garcia who has to play, Max Garcia has played some for this team. Um, you, we know Eric McCoy has played. We know Cesar Ruiz mm -hmm. has played. So you can you can kind of get the the cohesion together on the offensive line easier. And then now, Derek Carr has found in Chris Olave and Rashid Shahid two guys that he has liked all this season. Now you bring in At Perry. Yeah. So no matter what happens with the receiving core. You've got three guys there that you feel really good about. 
Now, can you get a fourth and a fifth guy that you feel good about? And we don't know what Michael Thompson's situation is going to be Mm -hmm. or, you know, Keith Kirkwood or anything like that. But we know those three guys who finished out the season, they got to feel pretty good about having those three guys on the roster. So you work with those guys and that that chemistry already is there. You just make sure that it doesn't dip. You make sure that it continues. And it's tough to just continue it from one season to the next. That's why you got to have those all season workouts Mm -hmm. and you got to have those OTAs and you got to have mini camp and all those kinds of things to make sure that things are still there and it's still clicking because Derek Carr needs to to understand A.T. Perry is on the field. I can throw it high and I can throw it back shoulder and A.T. is going to bail me out. He's going to make me he's going to make me right. Chris Olave is on the field. I can throw it deep and Chris Olave is going to make me right. You know, um, Rashid Shahid's on the field. You know, I'm going to tell him to run hard for 20 yards and turn around, and he's going to make me right. So he's got three guys that he feels like can make him right no matter what happens. And that builds the confidence of the receivers and the quarterback. So those things should hopefully trail over into the offseason and into the next season because they have time on task. They got stuff on film that they can look at and say, you know what, this worked. And nobody, I don't care who it is, can guard this. Mm -hmm. Nobody can guard what we're doing right here because this worked. We threw a perfect pass in the only place that our guy can get it. And we can do that against anybody. You're talking a lot about the passing game there, but DA did address the run game and how he feels like that needs to improve. And and that's, that's the perplexing thing because the O line came together and got, and got the passing game together, helped get the passing game together, but the run game. And a lot of that is schematically, defensively from the opposition where the opposition says, I see Alvin Kamara on the field. I see 41. He ain't going to be the one that beats me. He gets a lot of yards. He gets a lot of touchdowns, but he ain't going to win today. They're going to have to throw it. And I I think the saints saw a decent amount of that. And yet they ran 450 yesterday. Right. So it's, it's there. I, I think they can be more efficient at it. And we heard talk throughout the season of where they say, you know, hey, we, we miss a block and a guy gets the ball carrier down. And it could have been a you know 15 yard, 20 yard game or, you know, we, we make the right call and, you know, everything that, and, the, and the back doesn't hit it right where he's supposed to. So there are some things to work on there. And hopefully it will come to fruition because Alvin, Alvin Kamara still got something now. Alvin's got some juice and he showed it a few times this year. He just couldn't get loose in a secondary because they just didn't have the the schemes and they didn't have it blocked up mm-hmm. well enough to get him loose like they should have a few times this season. Hopefully that'll be kind of priority one. Now, not at the expense of not developing what they've done in the passing game because you don't want to get so run heavy in the offseason that you forget what the bread and butter is, which is going to be yeah. the passing game here. But they can, be, they can be so much more improved. We saw it yesterday. Kendra Miller looked fresh. Now, maybe the Falcons said, you know what? We don't even know who this 25 is. Mm-hmm. And he runs out there and all of a sudden it's like, oh, snap, we got to do something about this. And it's too late. And Alvin Kamara is different. When you see him walk on the field, you say, okay, all eyes on him. Yeah. We got to stop him. But even then, with all eyes on him, you got to be able to get him loose. And the Saints didn't do a good enough job of that this season. Going into this season, we felt like we had so many running backs, different that do different things. Three dynamic backs in Jamal Williams, Kendra Miller, and Alvin Kamara. And we just, I don't think we saw enough of them together and available at the same time because Kamara was out for the first four games of the season, three games of the season. Then there was a couple injuries from to Jamal and to Kendra. So maybe that's just part of it too, is they didn't have them all healthy enough together to yeah. figure out how to utilize them. And it's hard to it's hard to figure out how to use three running backs. Yeah. I mean, there's only so many touches out of the backfield. So if you got, you know, if you have 65 offensive plays and 30, 35 of them are passes, okay, that's 30 carries left. 30 carries. Well, Taysom, if Taysom Hill's out, out there, Taysom's going to get five or six of them. Mm-hmm. So that's now 25 carries between three guys. So how do you distribute it and in what fashion? And that's difficult to do. And it's hard for a running back to get in any kind of rhythm when he's being used that sporadically. I don't care who he is. He wants to be on the field. He wants the ball in his hands. He wants to be able to, fig, you know, kind of get a chemistry with the offensive line. We saw Jamal Williams do that in the second half at Tampa Bay. 
where he got into a rhythm. He was the only he was the only back left. <laughs> Alvin yeah, got true. hurt, and Kendra Miller wasn't active. He was the only running back left. So he got into a rhythm in the second half, and he started thumping it in there. And all of a sudden, you know, it was tough for Tampa Bay to get him down on the ground and get the Saints offense off the field. Well, you can do that when you only got one guy. When you got three guys and you're trying to mix things up, it's a lot more difficult to find a rhythm and get a chemistry with the offensive line because all three guys have different running styles. And whereas this guy might, you know, might need you to hold your block a little bit longer, this next guy might be on your hip before you know it. And so you got to get to it faster. So, you know, some guys have a little bit more patience than other guys. Some guys know how to read the blocks a little bit better than other guys. And so I don't know exactly what the solution is to that, to be honest with you, except to, to kind of have a bell cow and use him. But then if you do that, then what happens to the other two guys? You can't ever develop a rhythm with them. Yeah. It, it's going to be interesting. We've talked, you know, at the beginning of the season, there's so many different offensive weapons. How do you distribute those, the ball and get everybody involved? And they found ways throughout the season, I think, that worked. They are going to reevaluate things, talk a lot about what they do want to do differently next year. And DA talked about what his message was to the team because they had a team meeting today before everybody is kind of let go. Um, and he just basically said, you know, he's proud of them, but overall things weren't up to their standard of yeah. winning and the commitment that it requires every day, every practice, off days to be successful. And that just because we've had that tradition of success doesn't mean that it's just going to continue without putting in yeah. a certain level of work. Yeah, look, I'll just start off by um, really basically, you know, what I said to the team, um, which was um, I was proud of the way that our guys um, continued to fight. I was proud of the way that we finished the season. Um, but I'm pissed that we put ourselves in that position. Um, and – when you look at where we've been the last three years, um, at you know nine and eight, seven and ten, nine and eight, um, it's not good enough. And um, and so I think we all have to look at, and and everyone in the building is 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 part of the culpability of that. You know, all of us, coaches, players, everybody, um, and so we have to look at. What do we need to change? Uh, and I'm not going to go into any of those details in terms of what changes will 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 occur. But there, there's things that have to uh, be different. Um, and so um, I think that's part of what we have to do this off season um, as an organization, players, coaches, front office, everybody. I think we just got to look at um, you know what do, what are we going to do differently because we're all part of the problem. And now how are we going to figure out how we can all be part of the solution? Um, and that's really what, you know, this offseason is going to be about. Nine and eight isn't good enough. And nine and eight wouldn't have been good enough even if Tampa Bay had fallen yesterday and the Saints had won a division because that nine and eight could and possibly should have been 12 and five. I mean, they should have won at least two or three other games where you look and say, you know, man, that Green Bay game was a winnable game that they didn't win. The first Atlanta game, you have two red zone turnovers. One is the pick six, mm -hmm. and the other is a fumble at the Atlanta five-yard line. Mm -hmm. That's points taken off the board and points going the other way. So that's two games you name immediately that could have got you to 11. Yeah. And you're free and clear in the division. And so now you feel a whole lot better than nine and eight and you're 11 and six. And now you're feeling like, oh, okay, that, that wasn't so bad. So nine and eight wasn't going to be good enough regardless of whether they got in or not. It would have been nice to get in, but it would have been one of those kind of side eye nine and eights like, Hmm. Yeah. Okay. So I think he had the perfect message and really the guys who are on this team who will be back next year, we don't know what the roster is going to look like, but the guys who sh who will be back should be looking at that nine and eight saying, man, you know what? We left a lot of meat on the bone. We we left a whole lot of stuff out there that we could have been 12 and five. Mm -hmm. We could have fooled around and got to, we could have got to 13 and four. We could have been free and clear. We could have had the number two seed in the, in the NFC if we'd have just done this or just done that. So they need to feel 
a little bit of hurt about it because it wasn't good enough. It just was not good enough. Yeah, unfortunately, the chips did not fall as we needed them to on Sunday with the Bucks beating the Panthers and then both the Seahawks and the Packers ended up winning their games as well. So no NFC South, no wild card. The season is officially over for the Saints, unfortunately. But fortunately for you guys, JD and I are still here. Yep. We're still going to be here all the time. Yeah, we'll be here. We'll figure out something to talk about, <laughs> I guess. Well, I appreciate it, JD. As always, you can find all of his work, our stuff on NewOrleansSaints.com, and we'll keep you posted as the off season gets underway. Thanks for listening to the New Orleans Saints podcast. Join us three times per week on NewOrleansSaints.com, the Saints mobile app, or you can download the podcast on iTunes. We'll see you next time right here on the New Orleans Saints podcast.